Thank you very much. Let me add my personal thanks uh, to all of you for having accepted the invitation to participate uh, to this uh, workshop. Only a few, few minutes uh, by way of introduction. Uh, many in the world uh, today feel that our economies are far from just, though the views on justice differ uh, somewhat. The Benjamin view has ended with the corporatist idea that governments ought to provide benefits in one form or another to interest groups. But this policy has, uh, as we know, left a little in the public purse for the marginalized and surplus people. On the other hand, the Rawlsian view has uh, found little support among legislators. It mainly supplements the income of low-wage workers and subsidies of one type or another. With little or no effective policy initiatives giving a lift to the last advantage, the market forces of the post four decades have precisely an opposed to drag down both employment and wage rates at the low hand. The setback has cast uh, the less, uh, the less uh, advantage, not only a loss of income, but also a loss of inclusion, namely access to decent jobs uh, that provide self-respect. This failing in our economies is also a failing of economics that is blind to the very concept of inclusion. The economists here who are here can testify that uh, in general economists never talk about inclusion. As a consequence, it does not map out any remedy for the deficiency. While um, people need a just economy for their self-respect, justice is not everything that people need from their society. They need an economy that is good as well as just. And for some decades, our societies have fallen short of any conception of a good economy, an economy offering a good life, a life of richness, as humanists call it properly. It. There is, as we know, a basic difference between prospering and flourishing. A country can prosper, but not necessarily flourish. And the prevalent way of conducting our policies, it seems to me, is not a guide to flourish. On uh, April the year 2013, the World Bank adopted the two ambitious goals, end global extreme poverty and promote shared prosperity in every country in a sustainable way. These two goals are related to the UN Sustainable Development Goals number 1 and 10, respectively. The two goals are highly complementary, which implies that policy interventions that reduce extreme poverty may or may not be effective in boosting shared prosperity if the, the two groups, the poor and the bottom 40, are composed of distinct populations. It follows that uh, to reach the goals, efforts to foster growth need to be complemented by equity-enhancing interventions. And this is possible because uh, the old idea of the trade-off between efficiency and equity, even recently, has been proved uh, not rigorous enough, or better to say, it, it is true if an economy is on the frontier, but if it's uh, below the frontier, the trade-off disappears. So a more rapid decline in inequality is needed to end poverty. Within a country, inequality is greater now than 25 years ago, whereas between country, inequality declined. So narrowing inequality and sharing prosper prosperity are possible in many, in many settings. Uh, inclusion is uh, one of our most urgent social problems. Curbed uh, in the decades after World War II, it has recently returned uh, with a vengeance. We all know that the scale of the problem, but uh, there has been little discussion of what we can do but despair. 
yet a comprehensive set of policies that could bring about a genuine shift in the distribution of income and wealth is possible. We need fresh ideas. We need new policies in areas such as technology, employment, social security, the sharing of capital, and also taxation. Above all, we need to go against the common arguments and excuses for inaction. That intervention will shrink the economy, which is not true. That globalization makes action impossible, which is not true. And that new policies cannot be afforded according to the so-called TINA uh, aphorism or TINA argument. I want to conclude uh, with a general <coughs> remark. There are um, those uh, with no hope in the future have only the present, and those who have only the present have no compelling reason to be interested in the future. This kind of people will never take any interest in the challenges confronting our societies. But fortunately, people who continue to entertain a hope in the future have not disappeared, as those participating to this workshop are clearly demonstrating. Thank you very much, and now I leave the floor to the President, to the Chair of the First Session. Thank you.